Welcome to my favorite part of the show, Frontline. They have been relentless, fearless, and caring in their bid to overcome a daunting task. Our frontline healthcare providers have been phenomenal in our fight against COVID-19. The least we can do is to cheer and spare them on. On this program, we have created this segment, like I told you earlier on, to celebrate our heroes. We bring to you some of the conversations we've had with some of our frontline workers. Let's meet our MVPs, leading the fight against an unseen enemy with their expertise on the battlefront, leaving their families and working extra shifts. This is where it starts for those treating COVID-19 patients directly. Here at the University of Ghana Medical Center, they have to first protect themselves by donning the appropriate personal protective equipment, popularly known as PPEs. Here at the regular treatment area, Dr. Imano Amwa and Dr. Ama Edwin have to do this. We are going to wear our full PPE. The reason is simple. When you go in there and then anybody needs any care, because we are in full PPE, we can offer the, 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 the level of care, the needed care for every patient. If you are not fully uh, done, then when you go in, there may be some procedures you may not be able to do because you are not, you are not in the appropriate personal protective equipment. I'm looking forward to see how the donning is done and, you know, the appropriate ways of, you know, donning the PPEs, you know. So there, there are protocols and the protocols have steps. So the steps will be followed. So we have supervisors here whose sole responsibility is to make sure that healthcare workers are donned properly before they go to offer service. Anywhere. So it's been a few good minutes, you know, trying to get myself in this. I have to tell you that it's not an easy process. Uh, my camera technician, Sami Hassante, is here with me. Sami, are you sure you can breathe? Uh, I'm managing. <laughs> <laughs> this is a laborious process and takes more than 20 minutes to don the full PPE here. You can't just go in. For yeah. every uh, patient you have to see, you have to plan. You have to plan the care. What exactly are we going to do in there? So that when you go in with, let's say, a doctor and a nurse, you'll finish all that has to be done for the patients before you come out. We try as much as possible to give you uh, a best eye view of what a day in our life here in the context of COVID-19 looks like. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, we are absolutely pleased to meet all of you. The situation at the intensive care unit, though similar, requires even more protection for obvious reasons. Dr. Daniel Soti and Dr. Emma Enima Adai of the intensive care unit have to dawn before they go inside the unit to offer patients there the critical care they need. Our DDNS is going to be their supervisor for the dawning and they would also uh, help each other dawn and then we would meet them as they go in, okay? Yeah, Emma and Daniel, you guys? Yeah, all right. Um, when I was at the other end, it took a few good minutes, I have to say, for the donning process. I, I think it's the same. Yes, it is. It is. Um, you, need, you need to take your time when you're donning because um, you don't want any part of your body to be exposed. Uh, that is very critical uh, because once your, your body is exposed, then your likelihood of getting um, infected is high. And then that means you're out of commission for two weeks minimum and that won't uh, augur well for the patients that we are supposed to be taking care of. So they have to make sure, because in their case, they are going to actually be touching patient, moving patient, adjusting oxygen delivery devices. They will definitely be in contact with surfaces that the patient has touched or had uh, viruses has settled on. So they can therefore not be protected. 
if when they checked this PPE that it was not uh, there were tears they're going to just tear the whole PPE and discard it to the into the bin uh, we do not take any chance at all and that is why it is important that these are available at every time we go in frequently is the nurse has already gone in the two of them are going to go in review the patients that are there work with the nurses and all that such a painstaking process to go through but for good reason yeah there are two reasons why you don't want your uh, staff your medical staff and for that reason for critical care staff to be contaminated or unduly exposed one because that is a risk to their life which is the ultimate reason but secondly we do not have enough health care professionals anybody who's exposed even if the person is not infected we will not know until another two weeks so if she goes in and then uh, she's exposed because of uh, the fact that there's part of the vessel that is torn, then that, what that means is that when we drop her off, we're going to quarantine her for the next two weeks. And that means one of our limited staff already gone. At this stage, we have to go back to perform hand hygiene. And we have to do this till the alcohol is dry, then we wear a pair of gloves. And that's what you see us doing. And we cannot skip any step in the dawning, as Dr. Wu was saying, because every step is important. We have to do all this because in critical care, we do a lot of procedures in different positions. Sometimes you may actually have a doctor who may have to go down to help lift up something. If this is too tight and you do this and then it tears, then you're basically coming out immediately. Okay, so all that is important in making sure that they're comfortable. These are critically ill patients requiring frequent uh, entry into the ICU and they're requiring continuous monitoring, which we do in our monitoring room through all the way through there. So it, all this she's done is basically fully, she's protected everywhere, making sure that not, no part of her body is exposed. And this is once used. She's going to use it only single. And then when she finishes, she's going to discard every one of them. And then in another short period of time somebody else we can see others are preparing in there and then they would move in so we use this so very frequently and that is why when we talk about ppes required frequently that's what we're talking about unlike mild areas or patient who are symptomatic where we can do non-contact care in the intensive care unit we cannot do non-contact care we may have patients who are ventilated we may have patients who are not ventilated but who are very ill severely ill uh, and requiring our assistance to keep them alive and therefore we cannot have any prolonged period of time without a staff in there deputy director nursing service uh, mrs eiram uh, and uh, auntie emma one of our senior nurses would actually come talk to Ladina. Uh, she had gone through what she's supposed to do, but they're going to reiterate all of that again, one by one on, uh, on a documented paper, but that paper is not going to go in. So I'm just going to leave them for uh, DDNS to take over now to explain to us what we're going to do, because that's nursing care. That's not my part. <laughs> as uh, Lordina is going inside, there are some instructions that I have to give to Lordina to do. And Lordina had to give this patient Mr. L met for me to check RBS during output and feeding. And then Madam R, you check RBS and feeding. And then Mr. M, you give a paralysis scan and any feeding pee. And then you check RBS and you and feeding. Thank you. All right, Lodin, are you okay with that? Yeah. So intentionally, we've not used directly our patient's name because, again, patient confidentiality is extremely important. These are patients who are vulnerable, who are very ill, but we still respect every single part of their identity and we are ethical with their care. So Lodina knows who Mr. L, 
Madam M and then whoever is, they would have agreed on all this. Okay? All right. And if you look inside the intensive care unit, apart from Lodina, you can see that there are three other people. Hello, guys, don't hide. Okay. So it is not only doctors and nurses who work in an intensive care unit. There are other health professionals who are also involved in the care and even in helping with what we do. So those are three biomedical engineers. Uh, um, who work with us closely whenever we need something set up, a machine check and all that. But recognize the fact that they are also don't. Yes. They just don't walk in. I mean, previously, we just give them a, a single gown to cover their letter and then they come in and work on our machine. But they have to fully done. And donning takes quite some time. But even more important is that they have to work under this condition. They have to work with all this covering their face. Sometimes it, their, their goggles are bled because they are breathing into it. Sometimes it's quite suffocating and sometimes they sweat underneath it, even if it's a, an ICU with air condition and all that. So you can see Lodina is preparing. But I also noticed that Lodina is talking to them so that if she needs any help, they are biomedical engineer, but they can still help her with nursing care. If they need any help, they can ask Lordina so that we do not multiply the number of people who are exposed at any point in time, okay? So we're going in to meet um, Dr. Danny and Enima here who are carrying out the activities. Okay, so I have made it. I feel like I've won an award. I've never been to an ICU before. So yeah, welcome Dr. Eniman. Welcome Komla to our intensive care unit for COVID patients. There are different degrees of illnesses, different degrees of infection. So as much as possible, we handle each individual patient with as much caution and care as we can. And we try not to transfer the viral load or the level of infection from one patient across to another patient. Hello. Hello, this is Dr. Adai calling yes. from the ICU. Okay. Everything okay in the control room? All patients vital stable? Okay, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that was just to demonstrate how we communicate with those outside. So as they are monitoring outside, we are monitoring inside and we communicate with each other. If we need anything that we do not have in the ICU, we communicate the same way with them to get those items ready. Okay. And as Dr. O mentioned earlier, the care in here is it's an overlapping care. Apart from medications, we have to do everything for the patients in here. We have to do nursing care, we have to bath them, we have to give them their food, we have to feed them. And we have to do hygiene, perform hygiene for them because most of these patients are people who cannot do things on their own. So it's not just a matter of coming in and giving medication, it's a holistic care of the patient. Okay, I see, I see yes, I see Dr. Soti. Yeah, let, me, let me just hear what he has to say. Hello, Danny. Hello, um, Mr. A's uh, blood sugar is 8.5. Mr. A? Yes. Uh, blood pressure? Blood sugar. Blood sugar is what? 8.5. Blood sugar, 8.5. Yeah, and we've given 500 of metformin. Okay. Um, to come up, um, let's uh, go to um, the patient area that we have prepared in uh, readiness to receive a, a patient, and then I'll go through uh, some of the things and equipment that we use to manage the patients. Okay, great. So, uh, let's just go. This um, device here um, that is uh, what we call a, a ventilator or a life support machine okay. um, this hasn't been completely set up yet but once it is completely set up it has a couple of tubings coming in and out of it which um, we use to connect to the patient 
Now there are two ways of connecting this life support machine or ventilator to a patient. So um, we call it uh, invasive ventilation and non-invasive ventilation. Now with the non-invasive ventilation, what we do is that we put a mask over the face of the patient, either covering the whole face or covering just the nose and the mouth of the patient. And then this machine blows air or forces air into the nose and mouth and then down into the patient's lungs. So if you have a patient or a person who as a result of COVID or any other kind of disease is not able to breathe properly, then this machine helps that patient to breathe. Taylor, yes. you, you finish your rounds? <laughs> Yes, I finished my rounds. Um, even as we go about working, we are keeping an eye on each other. So I'm watching Daniel or Dr. Seti to make sure that his seal is intact as we move about, as he also monitors me. If at any point we notice that anybody has a break in their seal, that person must leave and doff off or take off the PPEs immediately. Okay. So I've just been told that um, in, a, in a very short time, um, they will get out of here. They've administered the care that they had to you know, provide to those who are here. And in a short time, we all will be coming out. A few more communications here and there. And once that is sorted, we'll just move out. And remember, we have been told that once staff get in here, they do not get out because of the obvious, the possibility of getting infected Okay, so at this moment, we finished with uh, performing our task, and so we are going out to do what we call doffing, and we are going out with you so that you see the process of doffing. Okay. So we need to move, you'll be directed to the doffing area. Okay, sure. Now I need to mention that the duration of time you spend in here depends on the task you have to perform. There have been times when we've had to stay here for two hours, three hours. Personally, I've had to stay here for four hours before in this or five hours now i don't know how you feel and how comfortable you are i am literally suffocating but i can't say it yeah so imagine being in this for hours and for these hours not just standing but actually busy working and you realize that it is not an easy state to work in so at this moment we are going out to doff and the doffing isn't just about just removing everything at once as you see we take it through the process and you realize it's a very deliberate process, more thorough even than the donning, because the dolphin is the area where you can pick up the most infection. No matter how tired or exhausted you are, you have to take your time to doff off. Wow. So it feels like uh, I've been to battle, you know, and back. Uh, it's not been easy, but these, you know, health officials do this on a daily basis, really, since COVID. So I guess we have to give it up to them. It, it's not been easy for me. But um, Dr. O, we are out of that side. How was it in there? Um, I just, <laughs> I've just been to war and back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Um, 
this is basically what we do every day for the uh, past four going on five weeks. Basically doing ICU, but not only just doing ICU, but doing ICU in the midst of an infectious disease, a very dreadful infectious disease. Um, but we're getting used to it. We just, as I said earlier, on hope that this is contained. We'll Doctor, we will start with you, but this is more personal. I just heard you tell Dr. Ankama that she gets home sometime 10 p.m. and after every day since this. That must not have been easy. No, it's not easy. Um, in COVID-19, uh, you now have to not only do do this work late, get home late, but now with your family wondering whether you're getting infected and whether you're bringing infection home. It is difficult for them. Um, you have to keep reassuring them. There are psychological aspects of this, which you have to keep reassuring them. Sometimes uh, they feel lonely, but somebody's got to do this. And that's what we signed up for. Uh, that that somebody at this moment in our history, as health workers, happens to be us. It would be nice to have this done, to have this virus get out of our country, to get back to what we used to do, uh, and get back to our families. Trust you me, it would be nice. Yeah, I, I miss the, the, old, the old days. I miss family, of course. I miss friendships and those social interactions. They really meant a lot, and we now value those interactions more now because we are unable to do them these exactly. days. Um, Dr. Nye, I want you to just uh, wrap up for me. How has this changed your routines outside the business? Hmm, well, um, this whole thing, it's, it's a battle of a sort. It's like war. It's like soldiers going to war. Before you leave to go to war, you have to prepare the minds of your family back at home. Um, we've handled it differently. Some of us have had to separate ourselves fully from our family members, like myself. Currently, I'm home alone. Um, I've had to separate myself from my family members because some of them are among a higher risk group. If they get the infection, they'll be among the higher risk group. So as a first line, I've had to separate myself from my family for this period. You have to go through a ritual every day. When you get to your workplace, you have to go through a ritual before you can work. When you close from work, you have to go through a ritual. Sometimes you have to take a shower at the workplace. When you go back home, there's a whole ritual you perform. When you leave and you're going home, you cannot use public transportation anymore. You cannot expose many people to you because of the area where you have worked. So all that has also changed. Of course, our social activities have also changed. You can't, even though they say the lockdown has been lifted and some people can do certain things now, we are still on our own form of lockdown whilst we work in the treatment centers. And it is not every health worker who would accept to work in a treatment center. This is a volunteer job we are doing. We had to volunteer to come to the treatment centers. Every aspect of our lives have changed. And the psychology as well, because when a patient passes away, it is not an easy experience at all. I've heard people say, oh, you people are doctors. You've seen death so many times, so you are not affected. Trust you me. Every single patient who passes away affects us. We are very, very touched by what happens to any patient. In the same way, when a patient recovers, we are extremely excited. It encourages us to keep pushing because we've seen people recover. But when we lose somebody, it is traumatic. Unfortunately, you don't have the time to spend days mourning. The next day, the work goes on. Other patients are being admitted. Other people's conditions are changing. So all we have is each other, and we are as strong as our weakest link, like I told you earlier. You have to be watching your colleagues back, because it's not a selfish thing at all. If you protect yourself and your colleague does not, you pick the infection, and because we work in a group, we'll all be down, and we cannot afford that. So every day we check each other's temperatures, we make sure that we are healthy. If we see anybody feeling a little fatigued or having any symptoms, we immediately quarantine that person, have their test taken, and then take it up from there. We don't even have the time to follow the figures and monitor and do social media things like so many people are doing because we are working and our shifts, our hours are long. We have breaks, short breaks, but our hours are long, but we have to keep a fine balance. So every aspect of our lives have been changed, but we keep the focus on the fact that we are fighting a greater cause and we are doing it together 
and the team effort helps. We support each other a lot, and that is what keeps us going. Um, so I've been through the, the dawning and then the doffing of process, and that alone, I mean, taught me that this thing is not a child's play as we're speaking about. And so if you hear them speak like this, these are words from deep within them to you. And so the least we can do on our part, really, is to basically abide by the precautions that they are telling us rather than doubting them. And Dr. Soti, you want to add something? Uh, the only thing I'll add is that as we do our part as health workers to stave this epidemic in our country, we want the citizens to also do their part um, and then to pray for us uh, because it is not with our own strength that we do this. I, I thought, oh no, I, can't, I don't think I can do this. That is what I thought to myself when we were taught how to wear the PPE, the full PPE, we were told that the maximum you can stay in it is 45 minutes, maximum one hour. But you bear me, with me that when we went in today, we spent more than an hour in there. And Dr. Adai at the point spent more than four hours in the PPE. It's not through her own strength that she was able to do that. See, so we need their support um, as we fight this battle. And um, we hope that in the very near future, once we get this disease out of our country, we'll be able to jubilate um, as a country together. Well, um, I think um, Dr. Owu, Dr. Dai, Dr. Soti have really uh, nailed the message. Um, and to end it, I will emphasize the need for all Ghanaians to help healthcare workers. This is not a time to take this for a joke. This is not a time to take it for a joke. Um, if you are listening to this, please stay at home. Don't get into crowded situations. If you're leaving your home for any reason, wear the mask. And those of you who tend to stigmatize people, please desist from it. This is serious because you're preventing people from coming to a hospital and you're preventing people from not wanting to come back home, like the patient who is wondering how she'll be accepted back in her community. Thank you, Jai News. Um, thank you for coming to uh, see what we've been doing for the past four going on five weeks now, and for bringing that to your viewers. And uh, God bless us all. All right, so my name is Dr. Christian O. I'm Dr. Emma Enima Adai. I'm Dr. Daniel Soti. Dr. Joseph Atia Akama. Oh, so you heard from all of them. These are, I'm not sure they, they have a problem if we call them heroes, right? And uh, warriors, because they, as you've heard them say to us right now, they are literally letting us live this era of COVID-19, which we all know that it's wreaking havoc in many, many, many developed countries around the world. If the most developed, you know, economies, etc., are falling apart. So great respect and regards to these amazing individuals who continue to do this for us. And I on my own pledge to do the needful. I pledge to stay distant. I pledge to stop the spread. I pledge to save lives. I pledge to also abide by the precautions that have been told us by the health officials. That is my small way to contribute to this. I am Komla Aduma. I did this with Seth Tenge, the rest of the crew here from the University of Ghana Medical Center. Thank you for watching.
like I said, do send in your thank you messages. We shared with the rest of them. And I'll see you.